Hello, Kevin. Nice to finally meet you. Nice to meet you, man. Thanks for making the time. How'd you like it? Did it work? Yes, it really did. And I'm a big fan from, from all the way back. So that's kind of my first question now, because you're a few years older than me. I was like the target age for Masters of the Universe when it came out, but you were like slightly older than that. So what was your personal history with the franchise? Um, when I was watching, I was about 11, 12 years old at this point, and I'd been a massive Star Wars fan. Uh, my parents blew a lot of money on the action figures and stuff like that. So when He-Man and the Master of the Universe came along, not only was it a fun cartoon to watch after school, it also came with a world of toys. So I remember asking my parents, like, can I get this? And my parents were like, we already went through this with Star Wars. Those are your toys. You're not starting a new thing. So my interactivity with Masters of the Universe wasn't the toys as much as it was the cartoon, which I watched literally every episode of. But I loved animation. It didn't matter. I still watched Saturday morning cartoons at that age. I still watched the Super Friends. So for me, it wasn't like off brand to be sitting there enjoying this cartoon. It was just weird to not be able to interact with it like everybody else because, you know, it was made to sell toys. And that was the one effect that it wasn't going to have on me based on my finances. You know, we were not a rich family by any stretch of the imagination. So to be able to like years later grow up and then play with the toys, so to speak, in making this show, like felt super special. In a world where I didn't get to play with them as a kid, it was worth it to wait for this long. You know, you have a history of kind of uh, synthesizing elements of like a franchise's mythology. I mean, you did it all the way back with your Superman Live script. You did it with your Green Arrow run. So now it's Masters of the Universe, which has like a lot of different elements to pull together. How did you, um, you know, how were you approached for that? And like, what made you feel like you were the person to, to bring all of these pieces together? I honestly d didn't think I was and, and wouldn't have ever thought of myself as that person. Rob David, who's our Mattel television exec, Rob was the one that was like, oh, like, what about Kevin Smith? Because like, he read the comics that I had done, the Daredevil and, and Green Arrow runs. And he was like, you know, he's handled material that's not Jay and Silent Bob. Like he could be the perfect fit for this. So they came over to the house and then Rob was like, we'd like to talk to you about He-Man. And I was like, oh, what about it? And he was like, well, they're making a movie one day uh, we're doing a kid's version of the show called He-Man and the Masters of, uh, of the Universe, where it was kind of reinvented. So, but there's this middle project, essentially a sequel, a spiritual sequel to the original show. So this is for all the fans who grew up with it, who it, it, the show meant something to, who know every detail about it. So at that point, that, that was intriguing to me. If they'd come to me and said, like, reinvent it, blow it apart, man, do like they did with Shira. I probably would have been like, I'm not your guy. I'm not that talented. I can't recreate something, but I can keep something going. So I told them, you know, the story that I came up with, I was like, all right, well, if I was going to do it, this is what I'd do. And Rob really went for it. And he was like, all right, we're going to go pitch this to Netflix. And I was like, all right, where else are we going? Because Netflix never buys anything that I pitch there. And he goes, we're, we don't have to pitch it to sell it. It's already set up at Netflix. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I got a Netflix show? And he's like, well, if they like you, you will have a Netflix show. So even better, I didn't have to go in hat in hand, try to be like, please buy our show. They had already bought it. So it was like them going, well, let's see if you're the guy. So I told Rob my story, which is the story that you've seen. And, and of course, the second half. And Rob dug it. And he was like, let's go in and tell Teddy. You got to meet Teddy. So I met Teddy Biselli at Netflix, who like is the secret sauce in all of this. He was the kid who grew up watching every episode of this and had all the toys. He had parents that loved him. So he had all the damn toys and stuff like that. So he was the one that engineered this. Like, you know, he, he was like, I'm happy they're making the new version of the cartoon, but I want a cartoon for me that sequelizes the cartoon I grew up on. So that made it so easy to not stray from the path. You know, like I remember Teddy said to me point blank, he's like, look, man, these characters, when I watch this show, I always thought that Skeletor was going to kill He-Man. And he's going, and then I grew up and realized that was never going to happen. He's going, all I ask is that you give that to me again. Give me stakes. Make me believe that these cats are in jeopardy. And he said, but most of all, treat them with respect. I'll never forget this, man, because it came from a true place. And generally, you don't hear this kind of shit from the creative exec. And he goes, don't make fun of this. He's going, it's too easy to lay into the jokes and stuff like that. He's going, but this is rich um, intellectual property. He's going, the, the, the bench is as deep 
as DC and Marvel. Like, look at all the toys, look at all the different characters that you could play with, that you could give voice to. He's like, don't, don't do the simple thing. Don't, you know, make the jokes and stuff like that. Treat it like Shakespeare. And him saying that made absolutely all the difference. And he also, by the way, wasn't, he didn't say that and then we never saw him again. Teddy was there for every step of the way because his dream was coming true. He got to see what he wanted since he was a fucking kid literally happen in real time and be involved. He would give in suggestions like Marlena in our version, knowing that He-Man and Adam were the same is predicated on like a hunch that Teddy had as a kid. He's like, I always thought that Marlena was pretty sure that Adam and He-Man were the same person. He's Randor didn't know, but I was always pretty sure that. And so it informed the story that we tell. I've never had that experience where somebody in charge of the project was as creatively invaluable to the project as the creatives hired to work on it. There is some super deep lore in this show. Like, like you guys really, really dig into stuff that never even made it to toy shelves back in the day, right? So what was what was the thing when you got this job where, that you were like, yes, like this is the thing I have to do. Like we absolutely must have, you know, like King Grayskull or, or Scareglow or one of these other deeper cuts in here. For me, it was uh, it was Scareglow, um, Stinkor, and it was Paternia. Uh, anybody that knows the toys knows that, like they, you know, they showed you this play set where you're like, oh! and then there's no satisfaction because it was never in the show. So we knew that we wanted to bring that in, and Rob was a, a, a absolutely essential in that department as well because he's a, like not just a creative, but he's a Mattel exec. So he was the guy that we'd be like, all right, man, like can we use the land shark? And he was like, oh my God, how could you not use the land shark? He was the guy, he was like the gatekeeper of the characters, but Rob left the gates wide open and stuff. So an instantly when we were building the story, he would throw in stuff. He was just like, he was the one that brought up Scareglow. He's like, they never did Scareglow. People have been waiting for that for years on the old show. So the, the figure, of course they know, but they've never gotten to play. And that's when I was like, oh, well, God, maybe he could be our, our Satan, you know, in, in uh, Preternia. We took, uh, in, in Subternia, we took Preternia and Subternia and kind of mixed them up a little bit and made them our heaven and hell in that universe. Preternia, as originally conceived, was just, you know, back in the day before King, uh, before Adam, you know, the days of King Grayskull and stuff. So for us, we were like, let's remix it a little bit and make them our version of, of heaven and hell. And so that allowed us to kind of, go into realms where we could play with a character like Scareglow, you know, and have him make sense where it's like, oh my God, he's the Lord of hell. And then in terms of like Paternia, you know, we took the toy play set and literally made it heaven because for every kid that would have been heaven growing up. Like, oh, I want that so bad. And it's the joke is when you die and go to heaven, it is Paternia. It's the play set that you've always wanted as a kid. So there were definitely key uh, kind of load stars that we wanted to grab to put in, you know, and I knew right away, I wanted to do Stinkor because I knew Jason Mewes would need a job. And I was like, he's the perfect Stinkor. So there were definitely moments uh, and, and characters and beats like that. A lot of this is, is of, our, of our mythology is predicated on the Mattel mythology. Because for those folks that don't know, of course, there's the cartoon everybody knows. But before there was the cartoon, there was the mini comics that Mattel would put with the figures in, in each figure and stuff. So we went to them for a lot of the lore. The orb comes straight out of the old books and stuff like that. Uh, Andra comes out of the mini comics. We turned her into our way into the show. Uh, Tila's friend who's never seen all this attorney and mayhem before and whatnot. So she kind of acts as the audience. So we did, We and, and Hero, of course, uh, we bring him, uh, yes, I was trying to think, did I just spoil something? Yes, heroes in the first few episodes, first five. So it was, it was cool to be able to grab those because we knew those would be fan favorite moments, but not just be like, hey, look, it's him and then fuck off to weave them into the plot. So making Scareglow our version of the devil, like gives him an entire episode to play in. And, and you know, I, I know a few people who work on the show and I, I'm just here to tell you, it's probably the la not the last time you've ever seen Scareglow. Thank you.